A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The apostles and the brothers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles too had accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers confronted him saying, you entered the house of uncircumcised people and ate with them. Peter began and explained it to them step by step saying, I was at prayer in the city of Joppa when in a trance I had a vision, something resembling a large sheet coming down, lowered from the sky by its four corners, and it came to me. Looking intently into it, I observed and saw the four-legged animals of the earth, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the birds of the sky. I also heard a voice say to me, get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But I said, Certainly not, sir, because nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, a voice from heaven answered, What God has made clean, you are not to call profane. This happened three times, and then everything was drawn up again into the sky. Just then, three men appeared at the house where we were, who had been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to accompany them without discriminating. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He related to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send someone to Joppa and summon Simon, who is called Peter, who will speak words to you, by which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder God? When they heard this, they stopped objecting and glorified God, saying, God has then granted life-giving repentance to the Gentiles too. Verbum Domini. <laughs> A thirst is my soul for the living God. A thirst is my soul for the living God. As the hind longs for the running waters, so my soul longs for you, O God. A thirst is my soul for God, the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? A thirst is my soul for the living God. Send forth your light and your fidelity. They shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. A thirst is my soul for the living God. Then will I go in to the altar of God the God of my gladness and joy. Then will I give you thanks upon the harp, O God, my God. A thirst is my soul, the Dominus Fobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Jesus said, 
I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine and mine know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. Verbum Domini. Today on the Franciscan calendar, we celebrate St. Margaret of Cortona. And we could call her, when we think about today's society, a patron saint for those who are cohabitating. I'm sure that there are many viewers, listeners, who have children or grandchildren who are cohabitating. And St. Margaret of Cortona, she lived in the 13th century. She was born in 1247, died in 1297. And because of troubles at home, she went off to live with a young man that she was attracted to, whose name was Arsenio. And they lived together, they cohabitated for nine years. And it was after nine years, he was missing and his dog, uh, came and led her to his now dead body that had been dead for a no number of days. He had been murdered. And the shock of that brought home the reality because even during their time of living together, she was having questions within herself. It said that she was like St. Augustine who said, Lord, give me purity, but not yet. And so she had these questions, these struggles within herself about her own lifestyle and then when she saw how quickly life can end, and we will have to give an account for our lives before God, it brought her to conversion, a deep conversion. In fact, she would live the, life, the rest of her life in great humility, in penitence. So people who were sinners came to her for advice. She started a hospital and also a tertiary. She entered the tertiaries of the Franciscans and started a a group of sisters who were tertiaries as well. She was known for her devotion to the Eucharist and to the Passion of Christ. So when we think of St. Mar Mar Margaret of Cortona, she is certainly a saint that we can invoke today for this widespread phenomenon of the abandonment of marriage and just cohabitating together. And this past uh, Lent, the fourth Sunday of Lent, Archbishop Michael Sheehan, who is the Archbishop of Santa Fe, New Mexico, he issued a pastoral letter to the diocese, which he wanted read and was read in all of the parishes of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. And it's one, in fact, if you go to the website of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, you can find this letter. And because he brings up so many important points for our consideration today, I would like to read this pastoral letter so that everyone uh, can hear his much needed words today. There are no wasted words or very much something that needs to be spoken aloud today. And here's what he wrote. He said, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
We are all painfully aware that there are many Catholics today who are living in cohabitation. The Church must make it clear to the faithful that these unions are not in accord with the Gospel. And to help Catholics who find themselves in these situations to do whatever they must do to make their lives pleasing to God. First of all, we ourselves must be firmly rooted in the gospel teaching that when it comes to sexual union, there are only two lifestyles acceptable to Jesus Christ for his disciples, a single life of chastity or the union of man and woman in the sacrament of matrimony. There is no third way possible for a Christian. The Bible and the Church teaches that marriage is between one man and one woman and opposes same-sex unions. We have three groups of people who are living contrary to the gospel teaching on marriage. Those who cohabit, those who have a merely civil union with no previous marriage, and those who have a civil union who were married before. These people are objectively living in a state of mortal sin and may not receive Holy Communion. They are in great spiritual danger. At the best, and this is sadly often the case, they are ignorant of God's plan for man and woman. At the worst, they are contemptuous of God's commandments and his sacraments. Of these three groups, the first two have no real excuse. They should marry in the church or separate. Often their plea is that they cannot afford a church wedding, that is, the external trappings, or that what different or what or that what difference does a piece of paper make? as if a sacramental covenant is nothing more than a piece of paper. Such statements show religious ignorance or lack of faith and awareness of the evil of sin. The third group, those who were married before and married again outside the church, can seek a marriage annulment and have their marriage blessed in the church. Please remember that divorce still is no reason to refrain from Holy Communion as long as they have not entered into another marriage or sinful relationship. Many Catholics are confused on this point. Christ our Lord loves all these people and wishes to save them, not by ignoring their sin or calling evil good, but by repentance and helping them to change their lives in accordance with his teaching. We as his church must do the same. In accord with this, I would remind you of the following. First, people in the above three situations cannot receive the sacraments, with the important exception of those who agree to live chastely as brother and sister until their situation is regularized. Of course, those in danger of death are presumed to be repentant. Second, these people may not be commissioned as extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, not only because of scandal, but even more because one commits the sin of sacrilege by administering a sacrament in the state of mortal sin. Third, nor are such people to be admitted to the role of sponsor for baptism or confirmation, as is clearly stated in the Archdiocesan, Archdiocesan Affidavit for a sponsor. It is critical for the sponsor to be a practicing Catholic, and can, can anyone be seriously called a practicing Catholic who is not able to receive the sacraments because they are living in sin? Fourth, when it comes to other parish ministries and organizations, I feel it best to leave these situations to the judgment of the pastor. 
prudence is needed, avoiding all occasion, occasions of scandal, we must see their involvement in the parish as an opportunity to work urgently to bring such people to repentance and the regularization of their lifestyle. Fifth, many of these sins are committed out of ignorance. I ask that our pastors preach on the gravity of sin and its evil consequences, the sixth and the ninth commandments of God, and the sacramental nature and meaning of Christian marriage. Our catechetical programs in our parishes, children, youth, and adult, must clearly and repeatedly teach these truths. A church wedding does not require some lavish spectacle and entertainment costing vast sums of money. Indeed, how often we have seen the most costly weddings end in divorce in but a few years, few months or years. While beauty and joy should surround a Christian wedding, we must remind everyone that it is a sacrament, not a show. Sixth, those who are married outside the church because of a previous union are urged to seek an annulment through our marriage tribunal. If it can be found that the first marriage lacked some essential quality for a valid marriage, the tribunal can grant an annulment. Your pastor can help someone start a marriage case for this purpose. It is important for such couples to continue to pray and get to Mass even though they may not receive communion until their marriage can be blessed in the Church. Our popular American culture is often in conflict with the teachings of Jesus and His Church. I urge especially young people to not cohabitate, which is sinful, but to marry in the church and prepare well for it. I congratulate and thank those thousands of Catholic married couples who role model the sacrament of marriage according to the teachings of Jesus and his church. Sincerely yours in the risen Lord, Most Reverend Michael J. Sheehan, Archbishop of Santa Fe. So do we want to be followers of Jesus Christ? If we do, the Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that's part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. We're going to follow his commandments, which includes the sixth and the ninth commandments. But we all have to make that choice. And Archbishop Sheehan is like that shepherd the Lord spoke of in today's gospel. He's not going to run before the wolves who are going to scatter the flock and how much damage that we see because of cohabitation, children not having the security of uh, sacramental marriage of their parents in a lifelong union and how many consequences that's already showing in our own culture and even more so in the years uh, to come. So the church must continue to profess the truth about marriage, a lifelong union between one man and one woman, and how God does desire the salvation of all. And so we had in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles that is revealed to Peter that, yes, the Gentiles too are called to salvation in Christ that it was obvious that this was the will of God. And so the people rejoiced that this life-giving repentance is given even uh, to the Gentiles. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to offer just a word to those who may be in this situation. And there's some beautiful words we had in today's divine office from our Franciscan uh, readings for the divine office this morning and it's words of St. Basil the Great. And I address them to especially those who may find themselves in this situation. Here's what he said. The great physician of souls is ready to cure your illness. 
He is prepared to liberate every soul enslaved by sin. These are the These are the words his sweet and saving lips have spoken. People who are in good health do not need a doctor. Sick people do. I have not come to call the self-righteous but sinners to repentance. When Jesus gives this reassurance, what excuse is left to you or to anyone else? He wishes to free you of the pain of your wound and to show you light after darkness. The good shepherd who left the sheep that have not wandered away is in search of you. Place yourself in his care and in his mercy, he will not hesitate nor disdain to carry you on his own shoulders. Indeed, he will rejoice that he has found his sheep that was lost.